right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first Let's Talk About Water short film showcase. Uh, my name is John Pollock, and I'm going to be doing a brief introduction um, before we get to our fantastic panelists and short films. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today. Um, this is uh, an exciting event. It's a partnership between Quasi and the Global uh, the, the Global Institute for Water Security up at the University of Saskatchewan in Canada. Um, so really excited to be putting this event on today and we hope it'll be exciting for you guys as well. Uh, I'm gonna give a brief introduction to start, um, just a very quick overview of some of the really exciting LTA related uh, activities and deadlines coming up. And then we'll get to our panelists and we have actually four fantastic panelists joining us today. Adrian Thomas is a media production manager up at the University of Saskatchewan and has been doing some great, great events and training uh, related to Let's Talk About Water recently uh, through Shoot It Short uh, workshops. And Johnny Paul and Sarah Waldron, as well as Paula Buchanan are all quasi Let's Talk About Water Challenge Grant awardees. So we're really excited to have them here today to share with you a little bit about their projects and what they're working on. And in Paula's case, Paula will actually have a film to share with you. Johnny is a research scientist uh, concentrating in water prediction. Sarah is a film student. And Paula is a disaster scientist and emergency management researcher. So we have a very interdisciplinary uh, crowd today, which is really exciting for this program. A real quick, an overview of what's happening with Let's Talk About Water. Uh, this program has been going on for several years now. So since uh, early 2000s, uh, Quasi has been a collaborator with them for uh, over 10 years now. And we're really excited to now beginning uh, to work much more closely with our, our friends up, at, up in Canada. Uh, just kind of a quick overview of, of the quote unquote ecosystem where you know, Quasi, given our funding from the US National Science Foundation, we're really focused on US-based institutions, um, faculty and, and students as well. Um, we provide challenge grant funding uh, for the first time this year was for creating short films. And more um, traditionally, historically, uh, we've, we've uh, given funds for hosting film screenings uh, that include a panel of experts to use film as a catalyst uh, for community discussion around water. Um, our friends at, at GIWS, uh, more, uh, I guess, abroad from the United States focus. So obviously being based in Canada, they're looking at uh, Canadian institutions, both at the university level, but some great K through 12 stuff going on up there as well. And I'll, I'll leave it to Adrian to speak a little bit more about that. Um, but for us, it's really exciting to have them as a partner to be able to do some program collaboration um, like here today. And you know, I'll mention very quickly that up at GWIS, they're doing short shoot it short workshops. Uh, just did one um, with the CZ, focus on the CZO networks. And then we have an upcoming international, they have an upcoming international film competition. And I should also say a longtime friend of Quasi Jay Familietti also has a Let's Talk About Water podcast. So a few upcoming deadlines events before we get to the main event here. Um, up at GIWS, they have a virtual film festival going on. Um, so that, that's that been going on since earlier this year and is going through June. If you go to their um, letstalkaboutwater.ca, you can actually stream some fantastic films right on their website. Uh, I briefly mentioned the, the Shoot the Short uh, workshop that had a, a bit of a focus on the, the CZO community that happened earlier this month. Uh, at the end of next month, there's a deadline to enter short films in, in the, the international film competition. And then another really exciting event coming on in, in June is another Shoot the Short workshop, uh, which is going to be a stepping stone uh, for the World Water Forum. And kind of the hope there is to inspire some of the uh, local governments um, in, in rallying around the new OECD report, uh, Water Governance in African Cities. So that, that's a great international example right there. And then finally, you know, next year, if, if this and other events inspire you to want to create your own short film or host your own Let's Talk About Water event, we'll have our annual challenge grant competition. And you can start uh, looking at the Quasi website for updates about that uh, later in the summer. 
So with that, I just want to say thank you for being here today. If you have any questions about the Let's Talk About Water program, please feel free to email me. Uh, my name is John Pollock again, and my email is jpollak at quasi.org. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Adrian, who's going to speak a little bit about the film production process, as, and as well as give a, a few examples uh, here today with actual films. Adrian, take it away. Thank you, John, and uh, hi to everybody. Thank you for inviting me to be here. It's wonderful. Um, just to tell you a little bit about myself really quickly, there's a lot of sort of information to get through, so I'll race on through it. Um, just uh, about myself, I have basically spent my entire professional career working in uh, broadcast television, independent film and documentary production, television series, uh, commercial production. I've even done a few music videos. Um, so I started way back when as a lowly production assistant. And over the years, I've gathered credits uh, and uh, worked as a writer, a production manager, a producer, and a director. Um, I came to the university from uh, the private sector nine years ago and basically have drawn on my past experience to develop video resources for pretty much every aspect of the post-secondary world. Um, my group, uh, my uh, University of Saskatchewan Media Productions, we are all specialists with extensive professional experience in broadcast, film, audio production, media project management, and most importantly, research and educational media. Um, we support research at our university by creating uh, relevant media resources that engage other researchers stakeholders, and most importantly, becoming more important all the time, uh, communities. So it takes, so we've done everything from, you know, video abstracts to visualized experiments to short and full documentary type productions. Um, although we support all areas of research at USASC, we have developed a very, very strong connection with the Global Institute for Water Security and Global Water Futures pretty much right from the beginning. And uh, I think they had a lot of uh, vision, you know, when they basically decided to work with us. And we started going out into the field with their respective research teams. Um, we traveled throughout the Saskatchewan um, River Basin, which is their living lap, and it uh, covers a huge swath of territory in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. And um, so we traveled with them. We documented the work that they were doing and collaborated with them to tell the story of water in this vast and vital freshwater region. Um, so that work has evolved into our involvement with Let's Talk About Water, which of course, Linda, getting to meet Linda, which has been terrific and working with her as well. Um, last year was our first year of the Let's Talk About Water Film Festival, and it was regional to start with. And we got uh, very, very involved with um, the respective school boards and uh, got teachers very involved in working with us and working with their students to develop films, short films, two minute films. And uh, even with the onset of COVID, which of course disrupted the school year pretty dramatically for everybody, um, they still managed to turn out a huge number of films last year, which was so rewarding, so exciting. Um, and then, of course, we had a lot of entries on the international side from all over the world. I think personally, for me, I think the, the youth engagement has been um, really the most rewarding and exciting aspect, um, personally speaking. But uh, the wealth of films that have been entered and in, in the quality is just remarkable. And what a great resource. Um, Talking about production specifically, after all of these many, many years, I could go on about a lot of different things, but I just wanted to touch on a few basic rules that I always follow in production that have sort of stayed without, th with me throughout my entire career. And the number one rule um, is start with your audience. Uh, really give a lot of thought to who you are communicating with and what you want them to know or feel which sounds very simplistic, but it actually takes a little bit of thought and research in and of itself. Uh, I learned this rule at a very young age from my father, who was a network television programmer. 
<laughs> and uh, his other rule that he taught me was always feed your crew, which is probably just a good general rule for life. You know, if you want people to work with you and cooperate with you, make sure you feed them well. So that's a, that's a good one to remember. Um, my next rule and the one that I probably had to learn the hard way was collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Um, in this day and age in particular, where everybody's got sort of a, a really great camera in their pocket and everyone's a filmmaker, um, the best films are made from great teams. And all you have to do is obviously go to any feature film and sit there and watch the credits at the end. Good filmmakers always have a good team around them who bring a number of different things to the table. And so whenever you can collaborate, do so. Um, uh, you know, you can collaborate uh, with other people in your field and get their impressions on the work that you're doing, but try and maybe collaborate with industry professionals. Like if you're in a post-secondary institution, collaborate with people there who are actually making film. Um, you know, find somebody in your community who wants to work with you. Um, always, always look around you and see what sort of really great minds and creative spirits you can sort of pull into your project. You will never, ever regret it. Um, uh, one of the reasons that I think that collaboration is so important with us and why I drive it home is that my team, our production team at USAS, we're not content experts. We're not academics. Um, what we do is we work with the academics, the researchers, the content creators in the translation of their content to translate their content into the uh, into media platforms. Uh, that is what we bring to the table and that's what we do effectively, I believe, most of the time. Um, the last and maybe the most important and tricky part is uh, find a story in everything that you do. Um, a story will stick with people, basically. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more because I'm just going to touch upon why film and or video for research and science communication. Um, I think that uh, this is this this last year. I think has sort of shown us a lot of things, um, and we could probably go on at length about that, but we won't at this point in time. But I think it's really shown us uh, how difficult it is to communicate facts. Um, especially when we're in an environment where the facts are constantly sort of shifting a little bit beneath our feet. However, I think that uh, now with research in particular, it's become an imperative on a number of different levels that, uh, uh, that we communicate the information that we're obtaining and uh, make sure that people are understanding in clear plain language what it implies. So, it's also becoming an essential uh, tool and even a requirement in basically getting your projects funded. Um, knowledge mobilization, knowledge translation, whatever term you want to use to describe that has become an imperative. Um, it provides transparency. It also takes the information that you're gathering and it's giving you such a broad way of distribution, like it can be an educational piece. You could use it for advocacy, policy making, and uh, even for activism. So film and video do, do two things really well. And it's kind of obvious, obviously, uh, you know, clearly there's the show and tell aspect or the demonstration aspect of video, obviously it does a great thing. Secondly, tell a story, evoke a response, evoke a, 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 an emotion, if you will. Storytelling is relevant in science as it opens the door to non-scientific perspectives. It's an opportunity to capture authentic voices. It, it's a messenger. It's a direct messenger. It's an effective messenger. It leaves an impression. Stories essentially imprint themselves upon us. So before I go any further, I would really like to show you some examples of uh, storytelling and, and demonstration and use of science and communication. We've got three films that we're going to take a look at. They are very, very different. Um, but I would really love to hear after we see these, uh, what um, your impressions are, um, what you thought work in the films, what don't work in the films, how you feel about them. So without further ado, we'll look at three films that were uh, entries in Let's Talk About Water uh, during 2020, 
And without further ado. Thanks, Adrian. While we're firing up those films, I just wanted to mention real quick, if you have questions um, during throughout the webinar, please chat them in, you know, in the chat window, and we'll be sure to be monitoring those and read them aloud to the the. Mountains are often referred to as natural water towers. Mountain snowfields and glaciers act as natural water reservoirs. They supply more than half of humanity with water for drinking, irrigation, industry, and energy production. These regions are forecasted to be disproportionately impacted by climate change, which will result in altered streamflow patterns for downstream communities. Temperature and precipitation are key factors affecting snowpack, the thickness of snow that accumulates on the ground. In a warming climate, more precipitation will be expected to fall as rain rather than snow, resulting in smaller snowpacks. Furthermore, higher temperatures in the spring can cause snow to melt earlier, reducing summer stream flows. Scientists study both the water inputs and outputs in these alpine watersheds. We quantify precipitation, evaporation, water storage, and stream flow to better understand the processes occurring in these systems and future water demands. Yo, let's get the water in Flint clean. Sitting by the ocean, chilling with my daughter, picking up her trash. Now I applaud her. Her perspective of water is now broader. Pollution as the ocean getting so slaughtered. But looking at the sea and we see a healthy otter. Keeping the beach clean gives us better water. And that's what I taught her. Picking up your trash costs zero dollars. A future water scholar. Water can be dirty. 
water can be clean. Make sure you recycle what you get out the machine. Sanitary water is the uh, dream we could give to all the earthly beings. Water is 70% of your body. Make sure it's clear when you go to the potty. Water clears up your skin, it will make you a hotty. Consume water before you enter the potty. Deep in the ocean, you'll find an iceberg. If it breaks off, things will start to occur. Different changes in the temperature, and things will seem like they're getting absurd. That's called climate change. Things will start to get so strange. You might feel hot or feel a little rain, but there's so much knowledge to gain. This is a lesson, so please listen. Let's take care of our ecosystem. This is a lesson, so please listen. Let's take care of our ecosystem. This is a lesson, so please listen. Let's take care of our ecosystem. This is a lesson, so please listen. Let's take care of our ecosystem. John, uh, make sure you keep me on track with time here. Yeah, yeah. so we have a couple, a couple minutes to wrap it up and then a couple of minutes for Q&A. So we, ha we had one question come in about accessing the films um, that we just showed. So um, I said to shoot me a note and I'll help facilitate. But if you have a better tip, Adrian. Actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because I just met with the um, Let's Talk About Water team this morning and I brought up that very question. Um, one thing that I would do is encourage everyone to first of all take a look at the let's talk about water.ca website. There is a huge amount of resource there and also you can register to gain access to the virtual theater. The virtual theater is basically um, they're showing uh, some just absolutely feature length films that are fantastic right now, um, one new one each week, but I also on the website there is um, the winners from last year are all accessible on the website but behind that there are hundreds of other films and i actually did say how can we find a way to make this more accessible so this is something that they're working on and if you want to access any of the films or all of the films um fire off a note maybe to you john initially yep. and you can forward that on to the let's talk about water people because i said this is a great resource and we have to make it more accessible Absolutely happy to do that. And so I have a quick question while other folks may be thinking of, of questions to ask you, Adrian. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the upcoming film uh, competition and um, how folks can kind of keep track of that and potentially enter it um, if, if they choose to make a film at some point? Yes, um, there are, as we said, two categories. There's the youth prize. And uh, that is geared towards obviously high school, school age children all the way down to I think grade four. Um, the one thing that we do because they are minors is that they do have to submit under their teacher's name and with the appropriate permissions, you know, just because of the legalities of having minors involved. And then there's great prize money involved and that prize money goes to the class. Um, and uh, so they can take that money, they can spend it any way they want for the school, maybe for conservation purposes, whatever the case may be. Um, and then the international prize, uh, there is a ton, there's a lot of money to be won there, number one, it's a great prize. Um, the cutoff date is April 30th, and uh, submitting is very, very simple. They've got a great setup again on the website. You go there, you hit the submit button, it'll walk you through the process. Of getting your film in there and uh yeah it's it's really a great uh, competition the second year it's growing like you wouldn't believe it's very exciting to see how it's uh how it's coming that's awesome thank you adrian and so i haven't seen any other questions come in so we're gonna get ready to go to indrani next um just real quick to summarize a, a few points um or i guess not summarize but to add on to a few things that adrian said I just hope everyone out there, you know, in the audience here is paying attention where now there's this ecosystem developing where you can attend a workshop led by Adrian, you can get some money from Quasi to create a film, and then you can enter that film potentially into this great film competition to potentially win more money. So there's this nice kind of calendar of events that's developing that, you know, could be a great, great resource for folks, especially in terms of broader impacts of their work. 
Um, so thank you, Adrian, so much for joining us today and sharing the thank films. You. And really appreciate it. And obviously looking forward to continuing to work with you. Uh, so next up, we have Indrani, and as I mentioned early on, Indrani is one of our um, Let's Talk About Water Challenge Grant awardees this year. So she actually got a small grant uh, to create a film, and she's going to speak a little bit uh, today on what that process has been like and what got her interested in, in, in making the film as well. So Indrani, please uh, take it away. Absolutely. Thank you so much. John, uh, hello everyone. Um, so with uh, my, my uh, thanks and gratitude to Quasi, and let's talk about water. Um, and my uh, and, and thanks to Sarah, who will come next um, after me, uh, speaking about where we are and what our plans are regarding uh, the film that we are making. So first of all, I am Indrani Kaur. I'm a water scientist. I'm affiliated to uh, two institutions, um, the City University of New York's uh, NOAA Center for Earth System Sciences and Remote Sensing Technologies, as well as uh, the Earth Institute of uh, Columbia University. I'm both a scientist, a teacher, and uh, I am greatly interested in science communication as a whole. Above everything, um, uh, many of you have noticed uh, two of my daughters uh, beside uh, you know, sitting with me until now. I'm a mother of two wonderful daughters. Without them, I, I wouldn't um, even uh, start thinking about um, how, how powerful visuals and stories can be for um, you know, communicating complexity of the science in very simple terms. Without them, I, I wouldn't even uh, think about making a documentary film, um, you know, capturing uh, kids' perception of water for society. Um, and uh, these girls and their friends, and, and many of whom have uh, registered already to be with us today, uh, my heartfelt thanks to them. So I'm going to share screen with you. Um, There was some problem with opening slides. Let me share that with you once again. There we go. So what are the perceptions of um, uh, our kids who um, uh, you know, all know, know about water, the water is our life and um, every, every one of us. So here as a scientist, I always, um, always realized um, you know, how important the science communication um, actually is and how, how I always failed in communicating the, the science um, or in the science of water. I grew up um, as um, um, you know, being a performer on stage. However, while talking about science, I, I would never go without jargons. And sometimes that would create a lot of problems, um, even um, you know, oftentimes uh, you know, misunderstanding. So with my, my own daughters who are uh, six and a four year olds and, and their friends uh, from their book club, and many of uh, them are actually here, they registered uh, here um, to, to be with us today. And I was very lucky to find uh, Sarah um, as I wanted to create a short film. And I'm really grateful that um, Sarah could join me. Sarah could um, help me out in you know, planning uh, to create this short film. And we are in a process to, to, um, to film our, you know, start filming our kids and our school teacher starting this weekend. So with that, um, I will hand it over to, to Sarah, who can speak a little bit about you know, herself, who she is, and you know, how she came to know about this project, and you know, how we 
uh, met together. So Adrian was talking about the collaboration and we can talk at length, you know, what works and what not, but we will see how things come together as we start filming our kids um, on, you know, their perceptions about their own water, the, the fundamentals of water, you know, the water science, you know, where it starts from, the understanding where your water comes from and, you know, how can you save water? And, you know, very simple questions as we ask, uh, you know, the different kids from uh, pre-K to the middle school aged, uh, aged uh, kids who are joining with us um, uh, to, to be in this, uh, in, this, in this short film and one of their uh, teachers. So with that, I will stop and I will let uh, Sarah um, speak. Uh, Sarah, are you available? Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Waldron. I'm a junior at Ryder University where I study filmmaking and I had the honor to be connected with Andrani through a mentorship at Ryder. Um, we truly bonded right away and working together. So my role in this part is to take science and make sure that it can be communicated through film that works for everyone to understand what scientists are saying on the same level. Cause I know I am not a scientist. So it is sometimes hard for me to understand what's going on in the world, but by taking the science uh, communication and making it simpler for everyone else to view, I know that hopefully on the same level, they'll be able to understand it. So this sounds crazy, but me and Andrani decided to take children under our wing and make that our perspective of the film. Cause we decided that children sometimes don't get their voices heard as much as they should, and they know a lot more than we think they do. So in Johnny being a mom and me being a new adult, we decided to take that approach on our project. So right now, as she's mentioned, we're heading into our production phase. We've been working really hard to come up with new ideas and different aspects of the film we wanna see. So we decided to focus on kids and their knowledge um, to find out what they can teach us because we think that's a really important aspect of children in science field. And so we decided how can they educate us as young people and how can they tell us how to make an impact on the planet because they are gonna be the next generation that's gonna be here taking charge of our water. So this upcoming weekend also, as it was mentioned, was gonna be our first film shoot, which we're really excited about. Um, we plan to have a couple more days of shooting after our interviews to be able to capture what they're speaking about on the screen. And our main focus is just going to be the knowledge of the water cycle, how we can protect the water, and that we don't want it to run out in the future. Overall, in the two minutes, we're going to be able to have the voices of these amazing kids talking about their science and have science also presented by Miss McMullen, who is an elementary school teacher, and she's going to be able to show us the knowledge of these kids. So by being able to connect science in the story, we're gonna be able to make that difference. Thanks for listening to my part of the presentation. If you have any questions, just let us know. Yeah, awesome. sure. um, feel, please feel free to, um, to ask, ask questions and um, we'll be here um, uh, taking your questions and comments. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, and Johnny and Sarah. I really appreciate you guys being here and sharing your story about the story that you're getting ready to tell about water. Um, we'll wait a few minutes here, a few from a few moments, I should say, to see if we get any questions in from the audience. Um, while we are waiting, I'll I'll ask each of you real quickly: Has there been anything that has surprised you about the the film production process? And I guess, and Johnny, on your side, it's probably thinking a little bit about how you go about creating a film and Sarah, maybe on your side, it's about engaging scientists and how, it, how it's been, you know, kind of looking at that um, as a area. Okay, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so we've been collaborating. I mean, I, as a scientist, you know, I have been collaborating for a while now and I run, you know, this, uh, you know, John, this uh, virtual network of scientists and students uh, you know, that has grown from, you know, three people to 27 people. So it's all about people, right? So when we talk about collaboration, you know, it's the flexibility, right? And learning from each other. Um, 
so uh, right in the beginning, I, you know, I, we, I, Sarah and I made sure that I'm learning from her and we are taking full advantage of her um, own perspectives about the science or, you know, the production and, and she, uh, she is the owner, you know, she's taking the ownership of, you know, putting all these, you know, science and all these pieces together and making, you know, helping us, you know, telling the story. And I, as a scientist, you know, water scientist, given that, like, you know, we know, you know, and, you know, I've learned so much about water and the climate systems and all, I was like, let us start from the beginning, very beginning, you know, what is what water cycle? So when um, I reached out to some of our parents and, you know, they, sh they have shown a lot of enthusiasm. Um, so we also discovered that how much our kids already know about water cycle. I, as an engineer, I learned about water cycle during my undergraduate days. Even, you know, I have students who are learning when they are doing their masters. But these kids and the drawings that they are coming up with, they are so amazing. So once this film is done, I am going to show this film in my classroom that is full of, you know, the graduate level students, you know, who are coming from all, you know, all, all different uh, walks of life to understand and to learn about water. So we can't wait to, you know, have capture uh, these uh, kids uh, when they start talking about water. Yes, we are ready to, uh, to talk about water. <laughs> Sarah, do you have anything else to add? No, I just think that everything is the one, it's a wonderful challenge is what I like to describe it as because I don't know a lot about, I mean, I know some about science, but not as much as Andrani clearly knows and scientists, but I know how to tell a story. So I'm really excited to take these children's perspectives and tell the story the way I know and how to incorporate science with the help of Andrani. And that's what I'm excited about. Awesome. Well, we had a comment come in in the chat saying from Sophia saying, can't wait to see the final product. And you, you can count me in as uh, on that as well. So good luck with shooting. And uh, thank you both for being here today. Um, so we're getting to our last, but certainly not least, panelist, Paula Buchanan. Um, so Paula, again, to remind you guys, is a disaster scientist and emergency management researcher. And she actually has created a film so we'll have a chance to hear from Paula about the process that went into creating that film. We'll get to see that film and we'll get to hear a little bit about the next steps for, for that project. So Paula, thank you so much for being here today and, and feel free to take it away here. Sure, thank you, John. Thank you. And hopefully the technology gods will be happy and have a couple of slides to share with everybody. All right, uh, this is actually me out in the field. Um, that is me holding what's called a sludge judge machine. So um, I'm in the thick of it as a scientist and also as someone who is actually, as, you, as you'll see, has done a film. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a disaster scientist and an emergency management researcher. So from the previous slide, you saw, okay, I've been out in the field, like Indrani, I, I'm a research nerd and a water nerd, but you know, how did I get to the point of actually getting interested in the science communication? Um, it, one of my many hats that I wear is I'm what's called a Voices for Science advocate. For any of you who have heard of what's called the American Geophysical Union or AGU, um, I'm in the second cohort of the Voices for Science program. They have a policy track and I joined the science communication track. As a lot of people have said earlier, especially some of the comments related to what Adrian said, it's really important to be able to put that story behind the science so it's more relatable and translatable. And so that's what, what I get to learn more about as, as in the science communications track. So my research interests are, so I'm a, what's called, I call myself a water nerd, but I'm also what's called a socio hydrologist. Uh, some of you probably, or many of you have heard the term hydrologist, which is, you know, someone who works on water. Um, I'm a socio-hydrologist. I look at the socio or the human impact of drink uh, uh, on the drinking water cycle. Um, so I do look at drinking water systems and how they're managed, managed um, the availability and access of water. But what I do is I look at the human side of that, you know, through public education and outreach and, of course, through science communication. 
So about my film, uh, from a research perspective, why did I pick water? Uh, one of the things that's very interesting as a scientist, I think other people would, would agree with me is the politicization, if I can talk today, uh, of, of issues around climate change and environment is just so horrible, right? But think about it, we all need water. I think the most anyone's ever lived without water is three days, and it was not a pretty sight after three days. So it's something that is universal, and you know, climate change does negatively impact availability and access to water. And then, of course, why produce and direct the film? Honestly, uh, I, that was not my intention. Um, I actually, with the uh, support of AGU and its Forces for Science program, I had actually decided that I would do something based on, and then Johnny would like this children. I was going to have a water themed scavenger hunt, which was going to be called the journey of water. And there would be all these different stages. It would be held at a, a, a senior home for older adults. And that would be a way to get both older people and younger people involved in the process, and maybe learn a little something, right? And then maybe act upon it later. So that's why I decided to do, um, I got an approval for the project and then dun, 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 COVID happened, right? So there's no way I'm gonna put a whole bunch of elderly people and children in a room for a scavenger hunt. So I made a huge pivot. It's like, what can I do? I have approval to do something, what am I going to do? So I thought, okay, what's easier than doing a scavenger hunt? <laughs> I'm gonna make a film. And I'd never done a film before in my entire life. Um, and of course, uh, we're going to watch it in a few, in a few minutes. Uh, it's called Attack of the Evil Fatbergs. It is an animated short film. And so um, I decided that's what I was going to do. Okay, so I'm one person and Adrian would attest this, you know, you have to work as a team. I'm one person, I couldn't do it all. So fortunately for me, I know some very talented people. Um, I, through previous jobs that I've had outside of academia, I got to learn all of these uh, professionals in different fields professional writers, professional voiceover artists, uh, professional uh, graphic designers and UX or user experience professionals. And two of them I actually worked with um, and you'll see their names at the end of the uh, credits. And they decided that they would actually want to work with me again. Um, honestly, I missed working with them. So it was great to work with them. And we basically divvied up the work. I was a director and producer. Uh, my colleague, Rachel Hart, was the UX designer and the graphics person, uh, did storyboards. And then my um, Fantangulous colleague, uh, John Suggs, was the writer. Keep in mind, I'm a writer by trade. So if I pick you as a writer, you've got to be good. Um, so the three of us met every week for about four to six months. We decided to hash out the script. And of course, I, I guess um, uh, Sarah might attest to this, you know, neither of them were water experts but they were more the creatives behind it. But, you know, I had to figure out how I could translate all the water nerddom that's in my head into something that's universal for everyone. And so that's what we did. Um, and you're probably wondering why I'm a grantee because I've already finished the film, which you guys are about to see in a few. Um, but what, one of the things I decided to do, which I think is really important is the public education outreach uh, component of what I do. When I made the film, I thought about what are going to be my next steps and plans. And I thought, why not create content for educators? Educators are online. They're doing this Zoom room thing all the time. Um, my mom is an award-winning educator. So I knew what lesson plans were and I knew how tedious they could be, especially in a traditional, in a non-traditional environment like the web. So I thought, why not include Attack of the Evil Fatbergs as a part of an entire lesson plan, an, an entire curriculum around water education and the journey of water instead of being a physical event, being a virtual event. Um, so that's actually how I will use the funding. I plan to um, you know, create what's called some web comments and also get some more input from public educators on different types of both print, I guess, traditional print and different types of multimedia content that I can put into it. So. Um, so we're about to watch the film. And then of course, there's gonna be plenty of time at the end for comments and questions. And so now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let's watch the last but not the least film <laughs> for today. Certainly not the least film. Thank you, Paul. And while, while Julia's getting that, um, getting that fired up, 
Uh, I'm gonna just ask a question, uh, the same question I asked uh, in Johnny and Sarah is, um, you know, what was the biggest surprise that you experienced? I guess we have the, we have the video queued up, so I guess very briefly, maybe, what, what was the biggest surprise that you experienced while, while producing the film? Uh, the biggest, I, I, I've done storyboarding before, uh, and I've worked in IT before and UX, uh, user experience design. So I think the hardest part was just the logistics and trying to find the right people. And fortunately for me, through the various jobs I've had within and outside of academia, I, I knew a professional voiceover artist who was in a Super Bowl commercial. And since he worked with me and he liked me, I couldn't afford his rate. So he's like, I'll charge you 10%, I know you. So, you know, having those, and I think Adrian would agree with this too, having those personal connections can really help, especially when you have a really tiny budget. Yes, Adrian, yes. And, and educators are enthusiastic uh, collaborators. Yes, they are. <laughs> There's a monster lurking in your plumbing, and you may have been unwittingly feeding it. In most kitchens, it's common to find fats, oils, and grease. Unfortunately, in many kitchens, these fats, oils, and grease end up going down the drain. The hungry fatberg waits to feed on these fats, oils, and grease. The more you pour, the bigger it grows. Until eventually, or worse, all these little fatbergs may join forces to clog pipes backing up sewer systems. Fatbergs threaten our water supply by dirtying water and straining water infrastructure. What can you do to fight fatbergs? Well, I thought you'd never ask. Responsibly collect your fats, oils, and grease. Safely dispose of them. Together, we can defeat the fat birds. I got a round of applause from Sarah and Andrani. I've made it. <laughs> you can add me to that too. <laughs> Thank you, John. So uh, feel free to ask me any questions. Um, it's only two minutes, but there's months of work in that. So uh, uh, feel free to ask me anything. I'll see the questions in the chat. And if you guys have too many, I'll ha have John and some other people help me keep up with them. So I'll ask one more question, Paula, while maybe folks are thinking a little bit. Um, one of the really exciting things that Paul and I have spoken about um, is around accessibility. So that was one of the things that I was really excited that the funding that we, that Quasi is delivering to, to Paula is around specifically language accessibility. And that's um, one of the reasons why, as I understand it, you're pursuing the web comic. I think you could speak to a little bit more about that. Yes, um, actually, I'll start off with the film. Um, when I first did the, the short film, I was going to have it, of course, in English, but also have it subtitled in Mandarin, Cantonese, and French, and Spanish, because I have a lot of international friends that are wonderful and would actually translate for free. Uh, and then I realized, you know, that's still an issue if you only have those five languages, right? Five or so languages, because there are a lot of people who are functionally illiterate. Uh, so what's the point of having it in different uh, translated languages if people really can't understand it? And so that's where, um, and I, if you want to create Bengali and Hindi too, please let me know, Paula. Yes, yes, and Johnny, thank you. High five, boom, yes. Um, so yes, I mean, it could be an entire project just basically translating the film or short comics into so many languages. That could go on for a long time. Um, so uh, I realized, you know, let's, let, let's focus more on making this more accessible, like John said, 
by thinking about having visuals there, but having it using the visuals to tell the text as well as the visual content. Um, so what my, my goal is with the web comics that I will do is that I've actually uh, picked two uh, uh, artists of color. One's a professional writer who used to work for Time Magazine. Another one is a, um, a professional comic book um, artist. And we are working together to create two different web comics. Uh, one will be with, with your traditional, you know, your text bubbles that you see, you know, uh, with, with text content in them. The other one's going to tell the story through pictures. And that way, hopefully we can design it so you understand what's going on without making your own text bubbles. And then from an educational standpoint, especially if say a public educator uses it, they could even have an assignment you create your own text bubbles. What's going on? So um, that's one of the things I, I'm really excited about because you know, even though we are in the U.S. Of, it, of, of A, I can tell you as you know, an educator and a second generation educator from my family, we have way too many people who are you know not from other countries, born and raised here all their lives for generations who are functionally illiterate, and so that's that's a barrier I want to try to shatter a little bit in my work. Thanks, Paul. Like I said, that that to me is just it's fascinating. I can't wait to uh, you know follow the progress of your work. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have a few minutes left in the webinar here. So we do have time for questions um, from the audience. I haven't seen any come in, or I guess if any of the other panelists also have question for the other panelists, I guess you know we we can we can do that as well. So I'll wait here just a couple more moments to see if we get anything in the chat before we wrap it up here. Today. Or any final comments from any of the panelists, I guess, too. Yeah, and Johnny, go ahead. I had a comment first is, um, how do you do all of that, Paula? <laughs> how do I? Uh, <laughs> well, I will say this, and this is not to disrespect academia as a whole, but I have a lot of work experience outside of academia. I'm not your traditional um, uh, academic. So I've worked in IT, as I said, I've worked in web design, I've worked in project management, where, which is basically a, a fancy way of calling someone a professional cat herder. So basically <laughs> when you are a professional cat herder, AKA project manager, you know how to you know, run meetings and how to pick the right talent. And I think probably the hardest part of working as a project manager or cat herder is not just picking people who are creatives who are talented, but picking the, them, those ones who are actually got a little bit of structure or organization. Because when you do work with creatives, their brains don't work nine to five or whatever. You know, they, they, they are who they are and they create brilliant work, but sometimes getting them to show up on time regularly for a meeting can be a challenge. So the two people that I worked with, Rachel and John, I've worked with them before. I know they are good internal project managers. For example, once I completely forgot about the meeting, I thought we had rescheduled it. And Rachel texted me as the creative, um, one of the creators on the team and said, hey, aren't we meeting it right now? You know, that's wonderful trait to have. <laughs> so yes, picking the right people is key. So we got another question coming in for you, Paula. Why did you choose fatbergs as a topic? Uh, fatbergs was actually an easy topic because it basically relates to what we all do. Um, one of the things I forgot to mention is that I didn't want the film to be too preachy. I think as academics and researchers, we're like, this is what you have to do because I say so. And that's just not the academic that I am. I'm trying to educate you to empower you. Um, I'm not saying do this because I'm telling you. I'm saying this is something that we can all share. We can all be better stewards of our water. And as you saw from that first um, uh, picture of me in that wonderful bright orange uh, outfit and, and yellow hat, I know what fatbergs are because unfortunately I've had to deal mm -hmm. with them in water infrastructure. And it's something that's universal. I mean, it's happening in the UK. It's happening wherever there's water infrastructure. And it's something that's easily, relatively easy for us to actually mitigate or lessen the impact of. For example, flushable wipes aren't flushable. 
um, that is a huge issue to deal with. You know, when you wash your hands, you don't have to just keep the water tap on. You should probably turn it off. So just little things that we can all do is so important. And that's why I focused on something that's universal and relatively simple like Fatbergs. And even though they're disgusting, the name is really cute. Thanks, Paula. Do we have any other questions either from panelists for other panelists or from the audience for the panelists? Or any final comments from the panelists? All right, in that case, oh, Adrian, were you gonna say something? Do you come off mute there? Uh, no, I was just going to add to, I mean, I'm really, it's, it's so great to see um, these films that are being made for youth. Um, one thing that we found with the youth um, prize for Let's Talk About Water was when we approached educators, teachers, um, you know, in the primary grades, particularly, they really embraced having these resources that they could use with their classes. I mean, for them, it was thrilling and because it also it just sort of gives the kids another sort of interactive sort of aspect, something they can act upon rather than just hearing about things that are happening all around them and feeling helpless to be involved or do anything about this world that they're inheriting. So having these resources for, for young people is just so valuable right now. Awesome. Thank, thanks, Adrian, for your comment there. I was just waiting to see if anybody else had any questions or comments to add on that, but I, I'm not hearing anything. So I'm going to wrap it up slowly here, just in case something else comes in. Um, but, you know, at this point, I just, I really want to thank our four panelists, Adrian and Drani, Sarah and Paula. They're all doing great work in this uh, science communication space, you know, obviously with a focus on film. Um, it's really exciting for my seat at Quasi to be able to follow this and, and participate somewhat in it as well. Uh, I'd also like to thank Julia Masterman, who's been behind the scenes helping to support this webinar and the one dealing with all the uh, technology and, and uh, streaming of the video. So thank you very much, Julia. Um, and one last thing I'll, I'll leave you guys with is Quasi, as you can see up here, is, is uh, celebrating our 20th anniversary. So it's 20 years of water science community, which is very exciting, being able to facilitate collaborations like the ones that you've heard about here today. Um, we're running some communications campaign, I guess, with, with the uh, 20th anniversary, so you can, you can read about some highlights over the last two decades in our e-newsletter, which you can sign up for on our website. And then also follow us on, on social media. So on all the platforms, it's, you know, at Quasi. And we'll be posting and ha hopefully having some of you guys post as well with the hashtag Quasi20. Um, so thank you very much for being here today to the attendees. And especially thank you to the panelists. And I, I hope to be hearing from you soon and, and, and your desire to also be film producers like these folks here today. Um, so thanks again and hope, hope to see you out there uh, in the real world, not on Zoom soon. <laughs>